But you'll find it interesting uh, discussion and your time worthwhile. Uh, hope you enjoyed the dinner and grabbing a drink. Uh, how many of you are coming here for the first time to an event at Thai? Okay, quite, quite a few. All right. So, you know, uh, I think uh, as most of you know, Thai is a not for profit uh, organization uh, founded uh, some 21 years ago, uh, very much supported by volunteers. And um, basically, what we do is foster and inspire entrepreneurs uh, to be able to uh, build businesses and started here in Silicon Valley, but now in 60 cities, 18 countries worldwide, uh, reaching over a quarter million people uh, with events, programs, mentoring, connections. Networking is a very significant aspect at Thai. Many of you who arrive here at six o'clock, uh, the first hour is very much have your drink, have your dinner, and meet new folks that you've not met before. So, you know, we promote that uh, because it is just people you meet that uh, could be of use and help to the business or the professional career you're in, and uh, we promote that. Um, look out for our forthcoming events. Next week is a very interesting one, where about once a month, we feature a very successful, accomplished entrepreneur uh, who will talk about his journey and how he basically came about building this very large business. Uh, so that uh, event is next Tuesday. And uh, our website has information uh, about the individual and, he, uh, and his uh, company. Uh, we also have about seven or eight other events already published. So uh, continue to check out our website and participate, engage. Uh, you'll see a lot of what we do here is meaningful and relevant. Uh, we're supported very much by our board. Our president, Michael Shukla, is here. Uh, we have uh, a couple of our charter members here. Uh, Zain Jiwanji, also a supporter as a sponsor and a charter member, is here. Um, and uh, members, as well as sponsors, uh, this evening's event is hosted by uh, ENY. We are very delighted uh, to partner with them. Uh, we also have representation from uh, uh, BNY Mellon, um, Morgan Stanley, um, KPMG. Uh, you know, I think our sponsor list is very extensive, but uh, basically, engagement uh, happens at many of our events here. Uh, with that, I just want to quickly introduce you to our uh, host and uh, moderator of the evening uh, uh, session. Uh, it's a fireside chat. It's uh, fairly informal. Uh, and we are hoping to uh, reserve quite a bit of the time to Q&A so that uh, any burning issues or uh, topics or uh, questions that you may have, uh, please uh, hold that until uh, if uh, uh, you've had uh, time to uh, listen to uh, our uh, featured speaker, Mr. Ramdas, for the evening. Um, Ken Walter uh, is a partner uh, at uh, ENY San Francisco office, um, highly experienced and specifically managing their transaction business, MNA. Uh, with that goes a lot of advice, consulting, uh, fun, you know, financial transactions, uh, due diligence. Uh, he runs a team uh, uh, in San Francisco. He will talk about briefly uh, some of the kind of transactions he was involved in, and then uh, he'll take us into the evening uh, with the introduction to Mr. Ramdas. So with that, I'll hand the mic over to Ken. Thanks very much again. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us here tonight. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, hopefully an interesting discussion on doing business in India. Um, just a brief background on you know what I do. I work for a transactions practice. Uh, our transactions practice manages you know small transactions, large transactions. Uh, I think the thing we're seeing most of these days is transformational transactions in the technology space. It's interesting because we have a lot of companies at crossroads, uh, companies that are exploding with growth. It's it's a very interesting time to be in the valley. Let's say for all of us. Uh, and the entrepreneurs are uh, seeming to scare the hell out of some of the big players in the valley currently. Um, so transformation is kind of a topic of the evening and ENY is, I guess, going through its own transi transition, transformation. Uh, we just elected a new chairman 
Uh, with that, we've rebranded the firm. It's no longer Ernst & Young, which I'll say probably 30, 40 times tonight. Uh, it's actually Yin Wan. Um, it's global. It's a brand that you know, kind of transcends uh, nations, because I think historically we've had a lot of different brands within Yin Wan. Uh, you know, part of the transformation as well is we plan to double our revenue by 2020. I kind of laugh because uh, you look at that and you think a $24 billion organization doubling in size in a fairly short period of time is a scary thought. Uh, so I laugh usually when I'm scared. Um, so I, I think that's the high level on ENY. I think our, we're rebranded, we're globalizing. Um, and in that globalization effort, I think what we're doing is getting to know uh, different countries better. Our clients are doing more and more things globally, uh, so we need to be global. So we've engaged Mr. Rondas uh, to work with us in helping our clients navigate rules, regulations, uh, issues, um, you know, whether it's logistics, infrastructure, whatever it is in India. Mr. Rondas, through his deep connections, through his days serving India, uh, will help our clients and he's going to give some nice examples of where he's helped, how he's helped. Um, and uh, I think the one other interesting thing is culturally I, I didn't have an appreciation until uh, Mr. Ramdas and Tejas showed up on Wednesday and they started explaining to me what they've been doing. Uh, I didn't quite understand the hierarchy in India. I didn't understand how things work uh, and I think that's the overriding theme of globalization is we need to work better together. And uh, that's kind of the rebranding and why we're uh, headed down a path of being one firm more and more. We all talk about being one firm, all KPMG, I think so I'm proud. Uh, it's hard to be a global firm and be one firm. It's easy to be the Indian firm versus the US firm. So uh, I think Mr. Rondas will talk a little bit about how we're trying to accomplish that as well. Um, with that, I just wanted to introduce Mr. Rondas. Mr. Rondas. Good evening to all of you. Mr. Desai. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Ken Belter and my dear friends. <clears throat> I am delighted to be here this evening and I am overwhelmed with the response. People of Indian origin and the local people have come to listen to whatever I have to say. First of all, I am sure many of you know what IAS is and a few of you don't know what IAS is. As Ken said, we don't understand the hierarchy in the United States. So I would like to enlighten you as to what it's all about. IAS is Indian Administrative Service. When the British were there, it was called ICS, Indian Civil Service. There is a steel frame of India. That means they don't bend to the whims and fancies of the politicians. There is a concept, some of them do, but they, they cannot be here. But it is a concept. <clears throat> I is a service that is so popular in India. It is glamorous in India. So there is a clamor for it. This year, they took 100 IAS trains. And then the number that applied for the 100 vacancies is 625,000 people. I'm sure when I was talking to a few here, they said they wanted to be in the IAS. They tried, but they couldn't make it. It does not mean they are class two citizens. They probably are much better off <laughs> than an IAS. <laughs> But it is, as you probably know, the Constitution of the United States, in all the dollar bills, there is a 
humbling statement of the people of the United States. It says, in God we trust. So probably it is God's plan that I should be an IAS officer. You should be a business entrepreneur. <laughs> you should be this, you should be that, whatever. <coughs> Now, IAS officers are at the grassroots level and at the highest level in India. Policy making, policy advising. They start as an assistant collector in the training in the various districts in India. They go up to the district and on to state government in various departments. If you say you are a district collector, many of you would know in the American may not know. It's like the governor of the state. All departments come under them, the district. I'm not exaggerating. A district collector and IA officer in India is a Debbie God or God himself. <laughs> People respect him because he is known for his impartiality and integrity. <coughs> He is supposed to be fearless. He is supposed to lead the team. And therefore people look up to him for the correct judgment. I retired as Secretary of the Government of India, Minister of Service Transport. Dealing with shipping, road transport, national highways, lighthouses, major ports, it was a major ministry. Now it's been bifurcated into two. Shipping ministry and road transport ministry. And after I retired, I thought I'd plunge into private sector and help people. How did, how did I help people or how do I help people? I am a consultant, I am an advisor, I am a facilitator, I am not a lobbyist. That is, I don't go to the politicians and tell them what is to be done or should not be done. There are politicians who are good friends of mine, including the finance minister of India, Mr. P. Chitambaram, who came to the United States on the 12th of last month, July, under the auspices of United States, India, Business Council. One of the EI clients, EY clients, a very big company, it is client confidentiality, I cannot reveal the name. They had a difficulty in getting the orders of the government of India for infusing $360 million into a subsidy area of death. For three months, the file was not moving at all. So, there's a guy in New York office headquarters, whom I have known him since this height, because he's now taller than me. He met me and said that there's a problem that this company is facing. We would like to help the company. <clears throat> so I discussed with him threadbare, got to know what the problem was. And I met the chairman of FIPD, Foreign Industry Promotion Board. He is Secretary of the Government of India, Department of Economic Affairs, Minister of Finance, <coughs> Mr. Arvind Mayara. He is 18 years junior to me. During my talk, I will be telling you about you know, he's junior to me, he's senior to me. I mean, that's how the hierarchy goes. I do not know him at all. Except that he's 18 years junior to me and he's Arvind Mahara. I told him, I'm so and so calling from Chennai. I would like to meet you for this purpose. I'm sending you an email also. So, subject to convenience, let us meet. It comes straight away. I went to Delhi along with the representative of the company and the representative of EY India. Explained to him. Within three days, believe me, 
he cleared the fire on its merits. It is not because he is an IAS officer or I am an IAS officer, he cleared it. He cleared it on merit. What I am saying is, I removed the roadblock, I declogged the machine, and the file went through. And the company was very happy. Similarly, one of the subsidiaries had a problem with getting certificates for vaccines and medicines. And their headquarters to issue the certificates is at Mumbai, formerly known as Bombay. So I spoke to the Minister of Health, Government of India officials, and Mr. Arun Panda, he is a joint secretary, 24 years junior to me. And he called the Director General Drug Control of Government of India for the discussion. A representative of the company was there, I was there, and the asked the Director General as to what the problem was about and he gave the time limit. In 10 days it was be sorted out. You see, in India the files don't move with one visit. We'll have to have follow-up action. We'll have to meet people, pursue action. I went again and met the Director General in his office. He told me, Sir, he's not a nice officer. Please don't meet me because I'm embarrassed. But the company representatives, they discuss, and from then onwards, the licenses are coming regular. Again, I take law. The third example also is from the similar company, from the same company. I was to leave for the United States on the 5th of July. They rang me up on the 16th and said, there's a very major problem an issue dealing with DGFT, which is Director General of Foreign Trade. The chief of that company asked me, do you know him? I said, of course I know him. He is Dr. Anup K. Pujari, PhD in Boston, 20 years junior. Then I got the information by email from the company, sent it to Dr. Pujari. Within 10 minutes, I got the reply saying, Dear sir, I have got the, uh, your email. I am having the matter examined. Looking forward to meeting you, warm regard. So, we had to go to Delhi. And we were in Delhi on the 19th for the meeting. When I was to leave for the United States on the 20th from Chennai. I am saying, I want to help the client with all sincerity. So I was there, despite the fact it was all, not 11th hour, but 12th hour. So I have a bad habit of being punctual. <laughs> Rare among the Indians. Sorry. <laughs> now, I was there at 11.45. Mr. P Dr. Pujari knew that I was there and he came, Sir, it's a shame that you are in visitor's room. Must have come to my room. He called me to, my, to his room along with the competitor of his nephew. He met, discussed, and said, A particular certificate had to be issued for the medicines and vaccine. But from its effect from 11th of July. By which time the ships had left the ports and they did not know about this notification. So they should not be penalized. Normally, a notification is prospective, not retrospective. He said, I saw your email, and on that itself I had passed orders saying that this shipment should be exempt. And I said, you have not got the order. He immediately sent to the person, got a copy of the order, gave it to the company representative, an order copy to me for my file. So the company was supremely happy because Otherwise, it would have been another case of waiting for six months or one year. One of the popular, I wouldn't say misconceptions, maybe conceptions, <coughs> is that in India you have to bribe. My approach is very standard and simple. I go to the highest, either the minister or the 
slightly to come out of India or whoever is the head of the department. And when it comes from the highest level, down the line, they don't take money. Because they know that he is so and so is interested. That is my USP. That I have the access and reach to the top most. And whoever is the highest of the, it doesn't matter. For a population of 1.24 billion, source Google, there's a population in India. There are 4,787 IAS officers. Out of 4,000, only 100 are secretary level officers. They may know me personally. They may know about me. So, I have the access to IAS officers. An interesting example is, there's a company in India producing oil, oil exploration. I have been their advisor. They stuck oil at a village bordering Pakistan. So the Ministry of Defense said, you cannot drill oil there. Met the Ministry of Defense officials and told them, we are not having an underground to go to Pakistan, but we will drill only in Indian soil and convince them and the clearance will be given. And today, 10% of India's requirements are supplied by this company. We do import 70% of our requirements, but 10% is supplied by this company. Another example is, there is a company in Germany, whose Indian headquarters is in Mumbai. They had a problem in Kota, Rajasthan. They were building a plant, labor strike, violence, lawned out of it, not there. So the manager director said, will you please help? So again, I went to Jaipur, went to the director general of police, 12 years junior to me. And whether it's Indian administrative service or Indian police service, the seniority comes. They look up to us as elders. It's like your uncle telling you, why don't you do this for me? Or elder brother telling you, why don't you do this for me? So he was not well, but he received me in his residence. And in my presence, he spoke to the Sumanda police, and in two days, the matter got resolved. Now I can multiply examples. I will stop here, but I will also tell you, today is the climate for foreign direct investment. Mr. Chidambaram, under the auspices of the ESIDC, I told you, on the 12th of July, made a strong plea to the American investors, saying that we are building the Indian economy brick by brick. These are all our parameters. The GDP growth is 5% unfortunately this year. Projected project growth is 6% next year. Earlier it was 9.3, 8.9. Statistics are all available there. Our foreign exchange reserves are to the tune of $292 billion. But we have an immediate short-term debt of $172 million. billion. So once the short term that is off, the, the total drops immediately to about 150 million dollars. And there are states which give a number of incentives conducive to establishing industries. And in that uh, scenario, I, even though I am a Tamil Nadu IAS officer, Objectively speaking, I would say you must invest in Gujarat state. <laughs> I am not unpatriotic, I am being objective. Because there is the only state that has got uninterrupted power supply to the farmer as well as industries. And a surplus of 4,000 megawatts. No other state has got it because they believe in populist schemes giving me a free 
electric grinder, electric fan, TV. Without uh, electricity, I don't know how they work. It's a different matter altogether. But these are all to please the populace. So their, their, electric, their state electric boards have no money. They are in the red. So I am sure all of you must have heard of Tata, <coughs> one of the giants of India, in the industrial leaders. Now he wanted to put up a small car plant in the state of West Bengal, ruled by the communists for over 30 years, full of rice, full of labor problems. He couldn't move. He couldn't start. Lot of problems were faced by him. So what he did was he shifted the plant to Gujarat, a place called Sansad. The man of car, the, the, like the people's car of Germany, Volkswagen, started moving, started being produced. So Gujarat is a state where you have a place called Surat. Ninety percent of the world's diamonds are cut in Surat. They have special economic zones, they have petroleum zones, industrial zones. So and the bureaucracy is very friendly. The people who invite you to Put up industries. In other states, maybe they are either neutral or negative or like a But in Gujarat, they are very, very proactive. As a matter of fact, the introduction of subscriber trunk dialing system years ago in India was between Ahmedabad and Mumbai and not Delhi and Mumbai because Gujarat is known. The time is money. The culture is totally different. There are other states where you can invest. You have Tamil Nadu, my own state, where it's an auto hub. You have names like Leyland, Mercedes Benz, BMW, Mitsubishi, and Michelin tires, and Mercedes Benz produces their trucks called Bharat Benz in Chennai. So, similarly, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, these are four states recommended by many of the people who know where to invest, how to invest, and when to invest. Mr. Ramesh, do you want yeah. to talk a little bit about the upcoming election since you touched a little bit yeah. on the states, what's yeah. going on there? Now, the elections are around the corner, that is April, May 2014. They call it general elections for 543 seats of members of parliament. Now, as all of you know, in the United States there are two parties, Democrats and Republicans. In UK there are two parties, Labour and Conservative. In India, there are two major groups, NDA, UPA. Now, United Progressive Alliance, comprising Congress and the like-minded people. National Democratic Alliance, comprising BJP and like-minded people. It's just a gut feeling. I am not a sophologist. It's just a gut feeling that Congress, UPA, has made a number of blunders. People are not happy with whatever has been happening. And they, I think, they want to change. In which case, BJP will form the government. And who should be the Prime Minister? Mr. Narendra Modi. Incidentally, my colleague has come from EY. His name is also Modi. I asked him, are you a distant country cousin? <laughs> and this is, hello, this is called name dropping. 
also family planning, you know. That Modi is a distant cousin of mine. You know? So, Tej is Modi, probably is a distant cousin. So, if these two don't make the halfway mark, 272 is the halfway mark, there's 543 divided by 2, 272. Then there is a possibility of a third front. And who should be the Prime Minister in that case if Narendra Modi doesn't make it or Rahul Gandhi doesn't make it? Jai Lalita. I beg your pardon, very real. Laughing. Is she not qualified? I worked with her very closely in Tamil Nadu. Whenever there was a crisis, she would say, Where is Mr. Ramda? She depended on me so much. She's a very clever. You don't misunderstand me. Say, she's a very clever cook. <laughs> she's a very clever person. Very aggressive. Very intelligent. She didn't go beyond school. Of course, she studied in Salamaris College, Chennai for a few months. After that, she entered film time. Very attractive. People of Tamil Nadu like people who are very attractive. <laughs> because, you know, there was another mentor of hers who was the chief minister by name. N.J. Ramachandran. Okay. Now, she has no family. Incidentally, like Mr. Narendra Modi. <coughs> he has no family. He has no wife, no children, no uncles, no nothing. They are all by themselves. Mr. Narendra Modi has got an ideal Swami Vivekananda. Jayalata has MGR as the ideal. And then, what I am trying to tell you, they have no baggage. <laughs> to say that, you know, <laughs> So, this, this is the scenario as far as the elections are concerned. Yeah, they want to ask anything. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. If you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer to the best of my ability. Yeah, one at a time. Mr. Neelan? Yeah. Uh, since you are part of the Surface Transport Ministry and you work for it, why is the transport not improving in India, especially the roads? I think you are a young man. You are not visited India now. You must, it was a earlier notional highways, now it is a national highway. <laughs> National Highways Authority of India was languishing. I revamped it. And today we got 50,000 miles of roads. I say miles in the United States because we have not gone that big. Otherwise, I would have said 80,000 kilometers. More impressive than 50,000. <laughs> 50,000 miles of national highways, like Autobahn or Interstate Expressway, Parkway, so many ways we have got. And uh, I have got them strengthened, widened. Two lane, four lane, six lane, and then let's say from Chennai to Bangalore, it's a distance of 320 kilometers. You can do it in exactly five hours, four hours. I say four or five. It's not straight. It's not like a Formula One track. You got people crisscrossing, going here and there. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, we could have done it in three hours or two and a half. So, the situation in India today is to totally different. Roads and people prefer roads to rail because it is faster as well as you can deliver the goods at the house or go down. Now, Delhi, if you send it by rail, you have to pick it up from the slope, various compulsions, and then you have to take delivery. So, the scenario is different today. Uh, ten years back, uh, if my information is correct, uh, we were building around uh, 15 to 20 kilometers a day, but now it's only 5 kilometers. That very, is my question. Yeah, very simple. Ten years ago, it was cheaper to build road. Now it is very costly because of the laws of land acquisition. There's a land acquisition act called Act 1 of 1894. <coughs> very, very difficult to acquire land in India. Anything happens, they go to the court. And India, we are still a democratic country, unlike China. 
So there is suddenly a mushrooming temple, mushrooming church, mushrooming mosque. <coughs> a, you can't lose it further. So the cost goes up, the compensation goes up. So the and then the inflation is there. And therefore the cost of building a road is now much more than what it was before. And therefore earlier we were able to do 10 to 15 kilometers per day, now it is much less. Yes. Talk about the special economic zone scheme. I think it has got a lot of pros and cons. But as um, you special economic zones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has got some pros and cons. But yeah. I think cons are more than the pros. So can you talk about it? If you, you see, they started well trying to emulate China. When Samara, when he was minister, he did go to China, got some ideas and thought that they would do it. But then it floundered and did do well. And some states did well, some states did not do well. But uh, the state of Tamil Nadu is a special economic zone and they have done well. Gujarat has done well. Andhra has done well. Maharashtra has done well. So some of the states, they have, it, it all ultimately depends on the states of it. They have to give incentives. They have to... So, so many industrial clusters have come about in these four states. And it's a, it's a, a boom, a boom. But in other states, probably lack of electricity or lack of incentive, like sales tax, they may not waive uh, it, or there's not a uh, tax holiday. So, so many other minus points probably have prevented them from going further. Yeah. Another question for you. All, all the different <coughs> examples you have given, that it still tells me is, is that uh, things are still very not process-centric, but people-centric. And in order to get the work done, you still need to know the right people and make the right connections. And it still goes back to the old times when you have the license raj and bureaucracy, which all we recognize that they were part of the problem. In fact, they were the problem. And all these examples you're giving me, the recent example, that still tells me that those are still there. So why and anybody would be interested in going there and make and doing some business when they know that it's not still process-centric stuff to going on there? I'm willing to agree with you. At the same time, it is good to go through experts who know how it is, what it is all about. If you go without any support, it is very difficult, even wherever, probably in New Zealand you can get everything done um, across the table. But other countries, you know, all countries have got rules, regulations, major rules, and it's very difficult to overcome all those things. So that's why when you have a problem with the law, you go to a lawyer. When you have a problem with the body, you go to a doctor, some specialist. So similarly, those who want to invest, I'm not saying they should come through me. And I'm just saying they should come to the people who can clear the road grounds. It's an ideal situation that uh, everything is hunky dory, but it is not like that. But uh, it's just that it happens that if you know the person, it, it can, particularly multinational corporate. But, but is the political climate going to change at all that's going to make certain states better to operate in, or is it? Yeah, how should the entrepreneurs think about that? That's what I told you. State of Gujarat, people are very friendly, very proactive. <laughs> Such interventions are not necessary. You walk in and then probably say I'm so and so. In Andhra Pradesh also, I'm told. If you say I'm so and so coming from the United States, they even send the car to the airport to pick you. <laughs> like the Emirates. <laughs> and, sorry, business class. So, it all depends on the state. But that is very different. And even after many phone calls, many trips, at times it happens that you know, the officer gets changed and everything has to become de novo, start from the scratch. This is a, Difficult, difficult. So, 
somebody very big in the United States said, we shall overcome. We, we should overcome these difficulties. <laughs> and in other instances, of course, this is also quite relevant. You must have heard of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, the Guru of Swami Vivekananda, who said in one of his parables, if you want milk from the cow, you must squeeze the udder and not the horns. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, Mr. Pati. Yes. Uh, you this young man was in uh, Allied service in 1999. He's 39 years junior to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, but his dad was in the service. But then he would be in replicating the state uh, uh, governance model at the central level, given that there's a uh, a lot of uh, political uh, changes, right? I mean, one of the days when you have one central party which had overwhelming majority and could literally dictate, we have seen this uh, with the change of coalitions, with the groupings, that even how much ever you want to wish, there are other smaller political parties with enough weight, uh, not willing to support most of the progressive uh, economic policies. And the other question is, uh, in your uh, personal view or, uh, or your estimation, do you think the bureaucracy and the civil uh, uh, services will generally support Mr. Modi in taking forward uh, the Gujarat model and trying and building it up at the center level? I am an optimist. And I say it's half a glass of water, I say it's half, a glass, half full, not half empty. Both are correct. I feel if Mr. Modi becomes the Prime Minister of India, he'll make a very successful Prime Minister. Because, you know, he can't change the moment he becomes the Prime Minister. All his positive qualities will remain. Leadership, impartiality. All those will remain and he will guide the nation correctly. We had Prime Ministers like Jawaharlal Nehru who said, success goes to those who dare and die, sell them to the timid. And he was Prime Minister for 18 years, longest tenure ever. His daughter was also a strong Prime Minister. And Mr. Modi also will be a strong Prime Minister. If you are a, if you are a strong Prime Minister, down the line, they will toe the line they will fall in line. Now, for example, I had met Mr. Narendra Modi for a nearby client. Forty women, we discussed the problem. His mind is clear, no prejudice. He also said, why don't you do this experiment there, here, there. Very calm. He is an ideal to be the Prime Minister. I am not a BJP man, I am not a man of politics, I am a bureaucrat. But this is the impression I have Mr. Narendra Modi. But if it's a coalition government, how will the coalition yeah. be able to overcome? Now, coalition government has come to stay, and nothing can be done about it, because like-minded people are supposed to join and then form the government. Now, Recently, a political party from my state, Tamil Nadu, they didn't see eye to eye with the UPA government, this Dr. Manmohan Singh's government. So they said, we'll walk out if you don't do this. He said, get lost. And immediately they withdrew. Nothing happened. The government is still there. They think the government will collapse back again. Like nineteen, nothing happened. So with Narendra Modi, because of his leadership, for it, it's not that he'll be a despot, an autocrat, but a good leader who leads the team. He will see to it that all sections are pacified and no such move to to the right will ever happen. Yes. 
the person waving. I am a man of standing. What do you think India needs to do to create a more investor-friendly environment? We come across a lot of stories of companies doing business in India, and they either slammed a huge tax bill by the Indian government. On one hand, Mr. Chidambaram is here trying to say, "Come invest in India." And then you come across so many examples. Vodafone was slammed a two billion dollar tax bill by the Indian <coughs> government, and so many other examples. We come across so many boards here, uh, both talking about pulling out of India just because the environment is so unfriendly. So, in your view, what can we do? I mean, we we talked about China before. They are very bureaucratic, and uh, there's some element of corruption there as well. But they've been hugely successful <coughs> relative to the amount of success we had in India. So, what do you think we need to do differently to create a more investor-friendly environment in India? Very good question. <coughs> They are comparing apples with oranges. China's system is totally different, authoritarian. India is a democracy like the United States. In China, if you misbehave, you'll be shot dead. You'll be imprisoned and shot dead. In India, we go to court, then ultimately go to Supreme Court, stall it. Now, tax issues are complex. What of one cases? Uh, there are so many other cases also. But when you have a tax issue. And the interpretation is such that the, you know it can be interpreted. You are saying four plus three is seven. I am saying six plus one is seven. Both are correct. But the tax authorities would like to take as much tax as possible. That's why it's called taxing proposition. So they would like to. So what of one has suffered, and it's all in the court. Similarly, uh, there are other companies which are which are finding it difficult to overcome. Tax liabilities, and EY, they have a big branch relating to tax matters. So they also ask me about all these things. So we we'll have to convince the authority, Central Board of Direct Taxes, Central Board of Excise and Customs. They are all human beings like us, interpreting. So I said in, to EY in one of the cases, I know the Solicitor General of India. Who can nominate that this guy is really the man for intellectual property rights? You engage him, and you can win the case. So it is not uh, smooth sailing. I do agree with you. But Chidambaram had to say his piece to who the investors to come to India, and he said, and he is also as you know, uh, he studied in Harvard for some time. <coughs> Though basically it's from Presidency College, Chennai. And thank you very much for uh, very inspiring and uh, insight about what's happening there. And uh, a quick question is about uh, uh, now that we have seen uh, Andhra is being divided into two. Do you see that uh, we will have uh, probably 50 states happening in the uh, near term? That is uh, question one, and then the second question is: Before uh, ENY puts Mr. Modi in uh, Delhi, uh, <laughs> do, do you see that uh, entrepreneurs have, should wait before they invest back uh, mm -hmm. home there? Thank you. Now first, uh, is Telangana. Now we got 28 states, and Telangana is there. It's now it will become 29 states. So it's not going to be 50. But for a number of years, there is no state that is getting divided or bifurcated or trifurcated. So that the analogy is incorrect, maybe from 20 will jump to 50. The second question was about uh, um, EY. Whether the investor should wait. Whether the investor should wait. Whether the investor should wait. No, no. You should come today, not after Modi takes home. Even today we can do wonder. Because this is the time when the present government, thinking that probably whether they should continue or not, they try to help you to clear the projects quickly and earn a good name. 
and you get the positive side of it. So, you should come not tomorrow, today. <coughs> So, I agree with uh, your assessment of Modi's position. Uh, that's one statement. Mm -hmm. Second, actually, I agree with what the gentleman here said. Everything you repeated about the IAS process and literally how brokering helps businesses get through the system seems to repeat that India hasn't changed. So, given, given these two, the question I have is, do you think India will benefit from less government less IAS, and will Modi help with that? Incidentally, Modi also is having a quarter of IAS officers at Gurdi. <laughs> and they are all from Tamil Nadu. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, Kaila Sanadan is his uh, principal secretary. He is 19 years junior to me. <laughs> now, incidentally, I have a gift of God, a fairly good member. That's why I am able to deal with them. Now, British legacy is IAS. That has stood to the test of time. People respect IAS. There are bad sheep. I agree with you, there are bad sheep. But people do respect IAS. Generally, they think that they are impartial. They have integrity. They have farsightedness. Otherwise, you know, Chidamaram coming here could not have brought Arun Maya Ram with him. He could have come himself. He had to have an advice, and that was Arun Maya. So, you can't do away with IAS whether you like it or not. And the people clamor for IAS is still there because they think that there's the best service going. IAS man could be, I'm smart or I'm stupid. <laughs> But, but uh, IAS is the service that the vitamin pill. The Would it be fair to say because there is too much government involvement in everyday life? You see, we started with the socialist pattern of society. 1925, Harvard Congress. Like Nicholas Calder advising death duty, estate duty, this duty. They had to pay 120 percent, I think, when you die. <laughs> I mean, it was paying 30 percent or 35 percent. And some kind of, see, they all skewed up. It should not be like a socialist kind. It need not be like a you know, laissez-faire system like United States or even countries like Japan or Britain. But somewhere in between, you know. The tax, you know, how will the government... Now, Rajiv Gandhi seems to have said, it may sound hypocritical, but I think he has said that every rupee that is spent on various schemes, only 16 paise goes to individuals. The rest goes down the drain. That means to the pockets of a government officials. That's why now we have got direct transfers. And the, whatever benefit the individual gets is given to him through the bank, so that there's no intermediary Cybering of money. <coughs> Is it exhaustive or exhausted? <laughs> <laughs> she is from Andhra Pradesh, I know. Yes. I asked her whether she was from Telangana or Andhra Pradesh. <laughs> I'm still on. Yeah, Vishakur. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm the CEO of a company based here, and we do have offices in Chennai and Vaisak and we did exit late last year. Uh, but what I wanted to bring up is an experience that we have first-hand having companies there, is that we've told from the start for our management there that uh, make sure we follow all the laws, make sure we follow all the rules. But still there are things coming up all the time because there's no transparency, there's no clarity. So the question is, is there any movement to try to simplify all these rules? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. You'll have to wage a battle and then try to win it. For example, this uh, German company subsidiary in India had a problem at Chennai. They have a big plant. 
they ought to have had a doctor. They said, why should we spend the money on the doctor? They sought the service of a doctor next door. So that he could also, it's not that every day, there's industrial accident every day happening. So, and they were processing. They gave me what we do. Then I said, you please arrange to post a doctor. That is the requirement. Whether you like it or not, pay money, post it. And I saw to it that state withdrew the prosecution, which is the first president, they never had a president. That's using my good offices, what he said to the broker, which I don't do. This is using good offices. And then there's a concerned secretary I said, this is an excusable offense. He, they did not know properly. So don't penalize them like that. So they did post somebody and then... Yeah. The oh. problem is that here you can start a company within a day. You know, it's pretty clear on <coughs> what you need to do and how you need to go about it. And in India, even if you have the right intentions, it's very hard to figure out the system, uh, even for a small company or a big company. So unless there is some kind of uh, effort made to simplify and remove these overlapping uh, rules and regulations which are interpreted by the officials as they please, making it easy for them to be corrupt, to bully the investors, you know. Um, I don't think it will be easy for people to work there. It's certainly possible, but it's not easy. I largely agree with you, but still, I got some statistics. I don't believe you, but I got statistics. <laughs> <laughs> Source is World Bank. I mean, World Bank, when I say I don't believe, I'm talking, I'm not talking through my hat. Source is World Bank doing business report 2012. The number of days to start a business in the foreign countries would be as well. Russia, 18 days. South Africa, 19 days. China, 33 days. Brazil, 119 days. Do you know the number of days as far as India is concerned? All of you are sitting. You won't collapse. So I can tell you. Do you know the number? 27 days. With the IAS officer or without? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I'd like to reply. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Quite a, quite a number of people will appreciate. A few cannot appreciate. Because this is from cricket. What he did was he bowled a Google. <laughs> no, Americans don't play cricket. Actually, uh, we had a gathering in their office. A lady was sitting next to me at dinner. Do you know the position described in cricket for you? We don't play cricket, we don't. This position is described as silly point. <laughs> <laughs> and then cricket is the only game having long leg, short leg, spine leg. <laughs> why, why is there no movement to change the rules? You see... Is it just perpetuation of your... Not perpetuation. Change is slowly happening, perceptibly, possibly. But uh, I wouldn't say, you know, it will happen overnight. I will not say, but every day I read in the paper, so-and-so raped, so-and-so gang raped, so-and-so caught uh, taking money. Police officers and IAS officers also. So this is a pandemic disease. Nothing can be done about it. You read it. See, when you read in the paper, the so-and-so is caught, you'll be thinking that I, I should not be caught, I should not take money. But you take money and you're caught. So this keeps happening. The culture is still not uh, sunk in. Hello, sir. Um, I'd like to ask, so you mentioned in Chennai or in Tamil Nadu that there's the auto industry and some industries that are like, I think maybe older since, I don't know, perhaps 60s, 70s, or I'm yeah. not sure. So what's the difference between what happened there and what's going on now? I mean, is it just in general or is it per industry that there's concerns? It has its own plus points. You know, Tamil Nadu is the only state having three major ports in India. There are 13 major ports in India. Three in Tamil Nadu. There is Chennai, Chennai, three major ports. 
So whenever the car is made, the truck is made in the road export, you can export through these ports. And then conducive atmosphere. In Coimbatore, for example, Paddu is from Coimbatore. Do you agree with me that, you know, that industrial climate, faster of industry, uh, people, uh, you have so many IIT, in the, so many ITI, industrial training institutes, all based on automobile. So, when we have so many people in the workforce trained towards automotive, they would like to have their location near the Chennai. That's how all these companies came up. And then they have their own incentives and things like that. And, uh, so there was pre-planning that went into that, or that just happened, the market just drove? It is a combination of both planning as well as the entrepreneurs wish to have it in China. So if there's been success within that, then it, how there can also be success uh, for other industries? Other industries in Tamil Nadu also are quite uh, successful. There are so many textile mills in Coimbatore. I've heard of a town called Manchester in England known for textiles. Coimbatore is supposed to be the Manchester of India. So like, um, yeah, once again. Okay. Oh, I have one here. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, I think I'm a little different from the rest of you here. I'm traveling from India and I thought this would be a good opportunity to meet many of you. So I contribute to what Mr. Ramda said, but just a little bit of a different view. Uh, for some people to contribute or to continue what Mr. Ramda said. Uh, things are changing in India. I mean, I run a business in India, I run a business in Switzerland, so I've seen what's happening. But many of my people or friends here in the United States do not know that you can to pay most of the taxes in India now online. That came as a surprise to many people. And so when you say that things are changing, yes, things are changing. As you rightly said, it will take time. The Mistrust is on both sides. Government trust, does not trust the business people, so they introduced some system which became so so rigid that they started becoming problems. So the change needs to happen both on the government side and also on the business side. So we also have a responsibility, and that's what we are trying to do in India. That we are becoming more ethical. We are doing process oriented, and government is responding. So that's the positive part of it. Uh, as far as doing business in India, one of the things somebody said that broker thing, but we also have seen more and more joint ventures coming in. What you really need is an Indian partner who understands he can be a ENY or he can be an advisor or he can be a partner. And that's how things will happen very smoothly. If you apply the standards you have in the United States in Indian environment, that doesn't work. And so, so does it the reverse way. So so it's not good or bad, it's, it's just different. So I thought just to clarify because of my personal experience both here in, and in India and in Switzerland in Europe, uh, things are different, they are not good or bad. God bless you for the time being. <laughs> <laughs> you have added to what I have uh, said and support what I have said. Good. I just want to make one quick Explain. comment. Yeah, I just want to make one quick comment to follow up on the previous uh, comment. So we are now trying to start an operation in Bangalore. So the process is obviously complicated, right? <coughs> so when I look at that, you know, the list of you know, the steps we have to go through, right? it is not written correctly. For example, it says uh, to get an you know, approval for a line number, I mean, step number seven, get approval from 22 first. And I look at uh, 22, it says you know, I have dependency and seven, right? It's very, it's not, it's not, not even written correctly, right? The question is like when you frame the rules, when government frames the rules, at least it has to be looked through and then has to be written correctly, right? Then what is now happening is we have to go through a middleman to get a registration, right? So that's where the problem, some of this problem starts because it's not written correctly. No, this is called printer's mistake. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not justifying. Why don't, why don't you go to the officer who deals with this and tell him, please explain what it is all about. From 7 to 22 you have jumped. It's called Bob Beam Jump. Roger. So again, the time constraint. Time is money, so we have only so much time when we go to India. No, no, to this is important for you. This interpretation is important for you. If you have a rep in Bangalore, he should go and seek an interview with the officer and then ask him what it's all about. I am unable to understand. And he's about to clarify our answer. Just, just to respond, I mean, what you're saying is right and what you're saying is right, but it's not possible for every entrepreneur to go to government officers who can change. 
most of the time you go to people who operate and they are neither interested in changing nor they are equipped to do the change. So if it says 7 you have to do before 22 or other way around, you just do it because this guy is neither equipped to make that change because if you let that happen, there will be chaos. People would just jump from 7 to 2 to 22 and things like that. So only probably again, that's where your contacts to go to secretary to make that change can happen but not every entrepreneur is going to be equipped to do that or being able to do that and also the process orientation should not actually necessitate such a change. But well, because the rules are coming from 10 different directions, people do their own things and then they cross cross. But that's the mess, that's the jigsaw puzzle which you, which is India, which is good sure. and <laughs> growing market. So, well, we are taking the of that. Different agencies to handle it. Exactly. What kind of work? In cricket, this is called hat trick. <laughs> there is three wickets we get in succession. This is the third time he's asking. Yeah. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, please, please. So, what precautions uh, investors should take to safeguard their investments? So, for example, if you take a 2G example, many licenses uh, were just cancelled. When? 2G uh, licenses. Yeah. All that investment, I don't know where <laughs> it is. There's a big scan again. <laughs> These are all, you know, individual cases and as to what we should do in God we trust. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else we do. Well, tell me how uh, you yourself give yeah, a solution. No, 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 I am not giving the solution, but, but I mean, I am in that kind of situation actually, okay. I mean, I, I made some investments, okay, but I, mean, I see that it is not going you are a big investor. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, just give, I just gave that example, okay. okay I am a very, very small uh, this thing. Uh, the telecom scandal. Yeah, I understand. Uh, one of our big private equity clients in the Bay Area here, one of the biggest private equity firms in the world, um, their chief investment officer is somewhat said, uh, now he said it directly actually, India is either a zero or a four. I don't know why we're investing there. Um, so I, I'm hearing a lot of the, this from the audience, which is fascinating. So a slow change is going to is going to result in slow, slower than growth than maybe China. But you have a population that's fascinating because it's not getting as old as the rest of the developing world or the uh, first world, if you want to call it that. No, um, is, yeah. So it's how, how is Moody or whomever going to address this? The, the population is young. It's educated. With the proper investment climate, it seems like money would flock there in some ways, maybe faster, acceleration faster than China. But now, I think, I hope I'm right. If Mr. Narendra Modi becomes prime minister, he takes such drastic steps that whoever to this scam or any, anybody, anybody responsible. He'll be hanged, hanged not physically. <laughs> He'll be prosecuted. So when he means business, others know that they cannot. Do. He'll set an example like that and see that down the line the whole thing trickles. They know they will know that if anything should go wrong, they'll be held responsible, they'll be answerable, and to a large extent that matters a lot. It all depends on, you know. I love the translate. Eta Raja Tata Praja. In Sanskrit means whatever is the king, the loyal subject also will be like. King is bad, the subject is bad. Great. With that, let's give uh, our featured speaker this evening, Mr. Ramda. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your insights. I think it was very useful. Uh, discussion and insights and uh, certainly I think with ENY our uh, audience is uh, uh, well briefed and uh, hopefully they'll uh, reconsider uh, uh, as to whether they want to do business in India at this time or wait for Mr. Modi to take over. <laughs> <laughs> you know there was an interesting story uh, at Thai we uh, host a lot of delegations a lot of folks come in and I think Mr. Ramdas will be uh, pleased to hear that there are some uh, very uh, intelligent as well as uh, forward-thinking 
uh, you know, IS officers and, uh, you know, in the bureaucracy. And this delegation, they came in, they listened, similar kind of context, similar kind of issues. And uh, after everybody had mentioned about the irregularities, about the hurdles there to cross, the uh, corruption that existed, uh, they just listened very quietly. And then, you know, the lead person in the delegation, you know, I think it was uh, the secretary, sorry, he said, uh, I understand all these things. There are issues, but here's three things we're gonna do. And as to whether or not this will have an impact, we'll see, but we have a five-year plan. And the three things we're gonna do, first, we're gonna remove by specific order and review 50% of the legislation. This is in the state of Punjab. Because they feel that corruption happens because there are too many rules. I think there was a point mentioned earlier. We're gonna remove 50% of the rules. That's our goal. Number two, we feel that corruption happens, which we cannot remove, but happens because there is lack of awareness. So at every district office, we're gonna set up uh, information in local language that will explain what the rules and regulations are. So there is transparency. And number three, very importantly, that is amazing, we're gonna delegate the hell out of all the rules. So we realize that the man on the street goes to the man on the door at the district office and probably has to pay 20 rupees or 50 rupees to get his thing done. However way the man on the door gets it done. The man in the office comes in and he has to bring in, you know, one lakh or, you know, 10 that times the money. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, you know, owner of the business has to talk in, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and he has to go at the high level. So we decided that by delegating most of the rules to the lowest level, Job will get done for 100 rupees. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is very, very practical. <laughs> so I think those three things, he said, check us out in five years. We'll see if that works. But I thought those three things were amazing. I mean, if, if they can do that across <laughs> India, and perhaps Mr. Modi might be the man to do it, uh, I think it will take away a lot of the hurdles that most of you face uh, doing business in India. But with that, thank you very much for staying, asking great questions, listening very intently, and uh, Mr. Ramdas, real pleasure having you here. Thank you. And do come again. Thank you very much. And Ken, thank you. Thank you.